The subterraneans had divided themselves into squads of half a dozen to comb the tunnels for Reinhardt and his hostage. Keith, refusing to be left behind because of his knife wound, joined with Webster's unit. His hatred for the feminists and all they had done to him paled in comparison with Reinhardt. Not even his injury at the hands of the old man would keep him from evening the score and taking Reinhardt out. Angela clung to his side as they walked behind the men with the flashlights. With what little light came their way, Keith saw that her face was deadly pale, with her mouth arched with bitter disappointment, and near tears in her eyes heavy with concern. The situation is hopeless. For all we know, Reinhardt has escaped to the surface, with Claire as a shield, he can move freely until the curfew. That's not possible. He would have only been more conspicuous with the woman. What sort of woman would be seen in public with Reinhardt? It looks like he just crawled out of a sewer. I hope he thinks so. I feel responsible. And that's nonsense. Reinhardt's accusations were only his fantasies. Not about Reinhardt. Then about what? Claire, I'm the one who recruited her. We needed someone who could obtain first-hand information. She's the mayor's assistant. She risked being discovered and shot as a spy only to be threatened by the side she supported. We'll find her. He felt the shiver run through her body. She took her hand from his arm and turned up the collar of her quilted coat. Quiet. Webster had stopped in his tracks, his hands outstretched to the men to lower their lights. He cocked his head to one side, listening. Angela left Keith and moved quickly to Webster's side. She too stood perfectly still while cupping her ears. A sudden hope had lightened her face, but it died just as rapidly as it had been born. I hear nothing. Webster dropped to all fours. Turning his head, he pressed an ear to the steel rail. When he straightened, he looked puzzled. If I didn't know it was impossible, I'd swear I heard a train approaching. Do none of you hear anything? Keith, who had always thought of his hearing as acute, heard nothing except the constant dripping of melting snow. Nothing. Haha, <laughs> must have been the rumbling of your own stomach there, Webster. Perhaps. But all the same, we'll put out the lights. We can move in the darkness as well as he can. The lights will only warn him that we're on his trail. The lights were turned off, and they continued on through the darkened tunnel at a slow pace, as they groped for footing on the wet planks holding the rails in place. Keith was aware that Angela had dropped back to his side once again. He could hear the swishing of her skirt and smell the fragrance of her perfume. He wanted to fumble for her hand, to offer what comfort possible but feared that a hand that she couldn't see, touching her, might cause her to be startled, giving their position away to Reinhardt, if he were close. Webster, in the front of the group, came to an abrupt halt, causing those behind him to cluster at his back. There it is again. For Keith, there was no mistaking the sound. It was not a train as Webster initially suggested, but the sound of feet banging the concrete floor. Lots of feet, as if marching in unison. The noise vibrated and echoed through the tunnels, making the direction of them hard to detect. 
knowing only they were a far distance away. Feminist soldiers! As if to substantiate her statement, the sound of a rifle ricocheted through the honeycomb of passageways. Like the marching boots, the ricocheted echo made its location difficult to determine. All of them responded by scrambling for concealment, some dropping to their stomachs between the rails, and others dashing for the protection of the walls. Keith hid Angela behind him, shielding her body. The pistol he had taken from the communal room was in his hand, with his finger easing at the trigger, waiting for a target. He glanced from one direction to another, but only the darkness surrounded them. The echo of the rifle had died, though the feet marched on. However, the echo was only half as loud as it was before, making Keith wonder how many troops were down here. Wherever the shot came from, Keith told himself that those soldiers had stopped. Likely not from being shot, as there would have been more shots to follow, but to take notice of killing the subterraneans. Keith could hear the others regrouping, and he, with Angela attached to his arm, moved towards the sound of the others. I say they're ahead of us. We'll have to turn back and try to warn the others. They may think one of us fired the shot at Reinhardt. I don't think so. None of us took rifles for the job. And at least one man in every squad is smart enough to recognize the sound of a rifle. You're right, Matheson. Of course. Our only concern right now is for the others. I still say that they're ahead of us, and our only escape is back the way we came. God knows how many of the bitches there are and it's best if we regroup with the others. If we can rejoin any of the others. I I'm, I'm sorry, but wouldn't it make more sense to remain separated? I mean, unless you intend that we make a stand and fight it out. In smaller groups, we stand a chance of hiding ourselves. And what do you suggest? That we sacrifice the others for ourselves? Keith's right. The feminists would never come into the subways unless in mass. That's probably what Claire came to tell us. This is a carefully planned operation intended to eliminate us for good. The argument that was soon to erupt went to silence as the reflection of light came in their direction. Not a beam directly at them, but one that was moving steadily towards them. They began running as hard as they could, as they attempted to retrace their steps. As they did so, they stumbled a few times and fell in the darkness. Keith held on to Angela by her arm, and as she fell, he picked her up again to keep running. Another sound ahead of them caused them to stop. They stood panting, confused until the splintering of wood told them that the troops were tearing at the planks leading into the tunnels from the outside. As boards were removed, light grew in intensity and drove back the darkness. Angela clung to Keith, her hand tightened over his arm. We're trapped! Keith glanced quickly over his shoulder. The beam of light of the approaching soldiers was still a distance away, but closing. He thought about running towards them, hoping for another passageway, perhaps an offshoot in a new direction. But he didn't know these tunnels, and it seemed foolish to run straight into the enemy. Keith leaned back against a metal pillar to rest. He could feel the coldness penetrating the materials of his jacket. His senses were alert, his mind racing. 
the beams. Keith flashed to his time in the Hall of Records. While it contained records for just about everything, for Keith, it was more like a library full of information. Keith had read everything he could. Most of the stuff he read was more contracts than anything else. But seeing the beam itself reminded him of something he had read. Of thick metal skeletons that prevented outside buildings from crashing down into the network of tunnels. Webster immediately caught his meaning. It's a chance. There was no time to search for the metal ladders once used by the workmen to repair the tunnel roofs, as the light from the soldiers were already creating silhouettes of their forms. The men began scrambling up the pillars, edging their way inch by inch up the slippery surface until they reached the crossbeams. Thanks to the troops' lights, Keith could see the arms reaching down for Angela. He grabbed from behind and lifted her up towards the arms. While Angela was curvy, she was small framed and was easy to lift. One set of hands managed to catch her arm while another had grabbed her clothes. They pulled her up with ease. The light from the outside tunnel entrance was growing increasingly stronger on the tracks below, and Keith could hear the clicking of boot heels on the steel planks growing louder. The fear of their approach and the adrenaline pumping in his blood made it possible for him to get to the support beams in time as soldiers from the outside began forming on the station's platform. As they laid there, his arm was throbbing in pain. He was glad to have a break as his arm needed to rest, but he resisted the urge to cry out. Keith peered over to Angela. She had wedged herself into one of the air vents. The tail of her red skirt hung slightly over the edge of the narrow opening and her eyes glowed like a cat in the darkness. He knew by their wideness that she was terrified. He was unsure if she could see his eyes, and if she could, she would have seen the pain he was in. All the others were hidden from Keith's view. He cursed silently that he, unlike the others, hadn't had time to crawl away from the center of the tunnel, as the tracks lay directly below him. If any of the soldiers on the station platform should glance towards the ceiling, they would see a shadowy lump and likely investigate. The entire party would be discovered and captured, provided the feminists had any intention of taking prisoners. Keith saw the beam of light directly on the tracks. His heart began to pound wildly and his arm pulsated with pain. He wondered how the soldiers could not hear his heart ready to burst as it nearly deafened him. He covered his heart and tried to relax but the fear, anxiety and pain was more than he could handle and he could only stop himself from screaming out and keep his breathing at a minimum. Keith thought back to the night that had led to meeting Angela, running from the feminist troops. He had heard horror stories of feminist prisons, that it was a place for men to be tortured under the name of the law. Men already had a low place in society. But in prison, they were treated much, much worse. That night, Keith told himself it was better to run than to be caught. Right now, he told himself, better dead than captured. 
He continued to wait for the soldiers to say something about their hiding spot. To his great relief, the first set of soldiers with their lights had passed him. The second group that came from the outside followed them, but they didn't have lights. Keith wondered if that was an issue of tactics or an issue of not having enough money to give each soldier the basic equipment. Keith glanced in Angela's direction and saw that she was watching the soldiers marching on ahead. She must have sensed his eyes on her because she looked at him suddenly. A smile of reassurance formed on her lips. From the corner of his eye, he saw Webster step from behind a pillar. He was looking down at the soldiers, waiting for what Keith assumed was for them to be gone. Webster then proceeded to put one foot in front of the other and move towards Keith, performing a feat of balance that Keith once saw in a picture of a tightrope act in the circus. Once he was close enough to Keith, he went into a sitting position, with his legs dangling on either side of the beam. There's no question about which direction we take now. We'll hide ourselves in the section they've already searched. I don't think we should underestimate our opponents. Sending soldiers to come find us like this, I would presume another squad is to come through here and search again. In fact, I'm betting this squad will retrace their steps and be back this way, pushing anyone they haven't found to the crossfire of soldiers. To the distance, Keith heard Angela climb out of the air vent. If they come back this way, I'm betting they're smart enough to look up. And if not them, then another group will think to do so. We'll have to find another place to hide ourselves. Agreed. But where? There's one place. Not there. Webster cautiously got to his feet. Come. It's not far from here. We better hurry. Webster's arms extended from his sides, and he again walked across the beam with ease. It amazed Keith that the older man was so graceful when he wanted to be. All of them proceeded to get down from the support beams. Keith's arm was in too much pain to lower himself, and Angela insisted the men help lower him. Keith wondered if this was because she thought he was weak or worried he might scream in pain if he tried. Matheson helped lowered him, and it was Webster who grabbed him from below and helped him down. If there was a time to feel shame, this would be a great time, except there are more important things to worry about. Angela proceeded to lower herself into one of the men's arms before touching the muddy floor. The last man up slid down the pillar like the others had done. Webster wasted no time. Once everyone was down, he sprinted off. Keith had wanted to ask Angela about this place they were going to and why she dreaded it so much, but he figured he would find out soon enough. Several minutes had passed as they ran in the dark. He was following Angela at this point, but no longer had eyes on Webster. He was finally relieved when he saw Webster leaning up against a wall, catching his breath. Keith stopped to catch his breath, but noticed the others were doing something on the ground. They were digging their hands into the mud and slime. Keith was confused by this until they brought up a large metal disc similar to the covers on the streets above that led into the sewers. Oh god, I never thought we'd have to resort to this. The disc was set aside and in its place was a circular black pit. Here's the ladder. The clicking of boot heels could be heard once again, 
approaching rapidly from the same direction as before. Keith had hoped he was wrong in telling Webster there would be more, but he had assumed the worst, and the worst had been right. He watched each one of them disappear into the black abyss, until only he and Angela remained. She reluctantly bent down and began to descend. Keith had leaned down to assist her when the nastiest odor he ever smelled slapped him in the face. With this foul stench and the sound of running water, Keith now fully realized that they were journeying into the bowels of the city itself. <laughs>